Update 1.2 Crawhead released almost a year ago. Despite this, I only just recently realized that I've yet to cover the new lore that the update brought with it. For those unaware, the patch notes of 1.2 lied to us, for not only did we get the changes that it mentioned, but also several new documents, a new NPC, and more pieces to this puzzle of confusion. I think part of the reason it's taken me so long to cover the lore of 1.2 is it's partially controversial. A lot of the creative decisions made by the devs with these new documents were definitely not taken with absolute adoration by decent chunks of the community. But still, it's been eight months, so I really should have done this a little sooner than this. So, over the course of this video, I will brief us on all the new lore that 1.2 has added, what it means, and how it has affected theories since its release. To begin, if you aren't aware of the new content in 1.2, I suggest you check out my coverage of what was added. I don't intend on briefing over all of it again, since it is quite a lot, but it's also not enough that you'll most likely spot all of it through a new playthrough. So, your choice, what you want to do in that regard. 1.2's war updates mostly seek to clarify who exactly was the Elster unit that Adora saw prior, right? what her nature was. But also, it gives information on the origin of replicas, as well as the very nature of bioresonance. Let's start out with Elster. To understand the new content, we must first remember some details from the original game. In Signalis, lots of details aren't very clear. However, one thing that is clear is that there are more than one copy of Elster. And at minimum, there are two. The original 512 from Penrose, and the other Elster from S23 that we play as. Over the course of this video, when I say S23, I'm referring to Elster S23, not the facility. More details than that really enters a whole other ballpark of theory that frankly isn't relevant for this theory video. I'd love to go into a long, disconnected tangent about how the time loops and, and all the other sort of nonsense that occurs in the Signalis War works, but it's frankly not pertinent at this moment. What is pertinent, though, is that S23's past is widely crowded in mystery, the only spot of information we knew about her being that she was designated for this facility, and that of all the units, Adler is the only one to recognize her. Given that Adler is not the most reliable of narrators, it only held natural that there was an air of skepticism about most things related to S23. Was she real? Did she truly belong to S23? Or was she just a manifestation of Ariane? The other... Part of this is the other person who talks about recognizing Alistair is a Yule, and the Yule's clearly under duress, so we can't exactly take them either of them as reliable narrators. The subject delves into this question, beginning with the new Aura. Learns her long rant about the horrid nature of the nation, which goes to reaffirm many of the things we already knew about the nation, she drops a line that is a bit odd. What do you mean you don't remember me? Did you hit your head? It seems that she recognizes us. This is a bit of a big deal. S23's presence thus far had only been correlated in documents by a man who had properly lost his mind. You have someone who is mostly sane and mostly normal tell us we exist a briar, it's a pretty significant change. While something similar was done with the Yule, this is a lot more direct and exact, giving better context. And while it could be argued that she, much like Adler, is able to see into other timelines, this isn't the only piece of evidence which demonstrates the reality of Elster's existence, which suggests something more may be at the seams here. Going to the end of the game, we can go to the secret Adler study to read the new version of his diary, as well as the other documents that are found in this room. It is these documents which truly ground our S23 to reality, even more so than prior. Adler states, Date. 84217. Met with Calibri to review the latest additions to the faculty staff. As usual, it ended in an extended argument. No matter what I do, that woman just always has to have the last word. Still, we both agreed that the Ulster unit was a good investment, so no adjustments will need to be made for now. This demonstrates that in this version of the loop, Elster was hired by Adler and Calibri, something which is repeated when we look at the other version of the diary. Date 84219. Had to go down to the mining site today for the scheduled inspection. We're waiting for that new Elster unit we ordered. The shipment was delayed by several cycles, but the excavation progress is still on schedule, so it shouldn't be a problem as long as no more staff get sick. So this conclusively states that in two different versions of the loop, Elster S23 is hired. 
something we know to not be true in the original loop, but is true in a different loop originally given to us in base game. Before we go any further, there is one last document. The last document in the room is a short list that has an interesting list of characters on it. It's a list labeled Excavation List C, Demarks Nina S2301, BO, Ara S2318, aka the Vent Ara, and Elster S2301. So somehow, S23, Ara, and BO all worked together in the past, yet neither S23 nor BO seems to remember anything while Ara does. It also should be added here that there are now multiple timelines where Elster arrives, as contrasted to really it only seems to be one timeline where she doesn't. With that concrete established, I'm going to take a bit of a stab at a theory here to try and explain what is going on at least a little bit. One potential explanation here is that S23 simply lost her memories. We know a major motif of Signalis is the loss of self. We see tons of characters get overwritten by others, S23, I'm amongst them. So it isn't a stretch to say that S23's earlier memories were simply erased by the presence of 512 in her mind. This could explain why S23 was in the bathroom at the start of the game. How else could she have gotten into the facility, which is located on a distinct roommate planet, or she was already there? somebody already there, she likely would have fled from the chaos going on below the surface and sprinted towards the surface, only for 512 to erase her crucial memories of her goal to replace it with her own. However, I don't like that answer a lot, primarily because S23 doesn't seem to have that weak of a connection to the person who calls herself to Elena CO, at least from what Elena's documents say. Also, I'm not getting into the entire can of worms of who Elena CO actually is, because that's an entirely different theory. But it does really seem like Elena CO and S23 Alistair had some sort of a friendship going on, or most likely more than a friendship. So I doubt she just abandoned someone it seems she actually loved. An alternative answer leans more into multiversal ideas. One of the key ideas thus far in many theories has been that the loop is, well, a loop. A space of time repeating over and over again. And while there is evidence that still suggests that, Perhaps this chaotic nature isn't just contained to broken time, but also broken timelines. This is a huge leap from traditional signalist theories, which argue that time is repeating while space is staying constant, something that is describing why so many Elsters are piling up, why the bodies of the replicas have degraded to such a point, and all other sorts of nonsense that we see occur across the game. But it does seem to at least be partially suggested by this document. As before us, we have an R from Normality who worked with S23, and an S23 who never arrived. While it is possible that maybe R had attached from the rest of the facility and has been hiding out in her vents long enough for several loops to occur, thus far there really hasn't been concrete evidence that the Normality part of the game, this being everything outside of the loop we play, actually loops. So... Perhaps there's a bit of a missed part that we've been missing as a theorist community, and this is kind of our hint at the correct answer. Either way, this is certainly a perplexing addition, which suggests that we maybe understood even less about the loops than we originally thought we did. The next major hit of details we get with this update concerns the usage of replicas by the nation. We already knew prior a lot of what was told to us, but this update really just made it as opaque as possible to ensure there was no further debate on the matter. Classified information. Commander's eyes only. Aeon Guidelines 176 for the deployment of operational procedures. Operational psychology, in order to reliably protect the safety of our nation, Aeon must develop and deploy procedures and technologies to maintain complete control over all replicas and service of the nation. As with right Gestalt's, procedures involving operational psychology are highly effective for behavior control of replicas. The primary advantage of replicas over Gestalt is predictability. All newly deployed replicas of a model are virtually identical, both physically and psychologically. They all share the same memories, and under the same circumstances, a newly deployed Yule unit will practically always react in the same way. However, as soon as a unit encounters a new situation, it will begin to deviate from its original pattern. In some cases, this may lead to a unit being less effective for its intended purpose. This is called persona degradation. Using a wealth of private information about the life of the Gestalt each neural pattern is based on allows us to ensure optimal, uniform, post-deployment development of each unit. In simpler terms, our primary objective is the focus manipulation of the individual to ensure they remain as close to the original pattern as possible. 
and thus productive, loyal, and docile for as long as possible. This is called persona stabilization. Stabilization can come in many forms, and usually takes on the form of regular activities or fetish objects that distract and calm the replica. Total development of bioresonance technology that allows wide-scale direct behavior control the methods of operational psychology still remain the most reliable way to control both replicas and gestalts in the interest of the protection of national security. This document is quite self-explanatory, making several deep and complicated war notes be confirmed in a rather blatant way. But to review, replicas are used due to the fact that controlling them is easier due to their predictability. To deviate from the normal response that is expected is known as persona degradation suggesting that degradation is not what we see causing the state of corrupted replicas right now, which is again, something that's been long established in theory, but is now very blatant. Next, continuing in the game, we can get to a dark room. Looking around here, we find another new document named Stolen Files. It reads as follows. Carefully selected by Aeon, exemplary citizens of the nation are permanently cryogenically preserved in the normal archives, each becoming a normal pattern for a new replica model. Preserve the images of the replica as an incorruptible ideal, the original gestalt is erased from records and public memory. During the production process, when experienced bioresonant technicians copy that normal pattern to a new unit, the majority of episodic memories are altered and suppressed, while the resulting replica maintains the skills and personalities of the original gestalt. We will be unable to recall specific events from the life of the donor under normal circumstances. This ensures the replica performs its duties without distractions created by personal memories of the donor. However, even the best maintained replica unit will eventually be exposed to stimuli that may cause it to stalt memories to resurface. All units degraded in such way pose no particular danger, like all units with persona degradation, it will eventually lose many of their advantages over gestalt workers. Because persona degradation is usually difficult to identify from the outside, bioresonance is used by command units to surveil units under their command. Generally, it is recommended that to swiftly decommission and replace units before their productivity decreases, where they begin to show clear signs of individuality. When ammunition is rationed, alternative ways of decommissioning may be deployed at the discretion of local operational command. This document is like a blunt hammer to really drive the nail of what we already knew in. Persona degradation has nothing to do with corruption. People are erased from history and they become gestalt, arguing meaning we don't see the records of any other gestalt replica in the game. And finally, replica normal patterns have their memories altered and suppressed, something we see Elster slowly unlock her old memories of throughout the game. To be full, these documents are a mixed opinion to me. On one hand, they help the more simple side of the war be solidly walled off with concrete answers. Adler's Nikolai, for example, is probably solidly dead. The strong concrete answers can serve as building blocks for more complex theories and reduce the amount of confusion around even the core ideas. And it is hard for me to complain when the documents reaffirm conclusions that I've held for quite some time now. However, the blunt and overt nature of these documents is a bit grating. I'm not entirely sure they have any real benefit for any player or theorist, or holding their hand in a way no other war document does. To clarify, there's nothing wrong with the devs giving us greater clarity of the lore. However, as it stands, having this grand degree of clarity regarding this aspect when most other things we can barely make out the outlines of creates a degree of contrast that's just a bit odd. Not bad, just odd. So I understand, not agree, but understand why some are frustrated by their addition. To conclude, the last bit of new lore has to do with bioresonance. We can start by heading to nowhere, where, if we head down to the room where Elena's di third diary is, we can see a new book. It reads as follows. Even in the darkest depths, the song of the cosmos can still be heard in the ether, the sound of the stars. This is clearly a reference to bioresonance, and its proximity to Elena's diary builds further connections to her and her abilities, again, further suggesting the degree of interconnectivity between herself and Arianne by this point in the game. But its own message may give us some more hints about her general nature. Even in the darkest depths, even at her worst point, the song of the cosmos bioresonance and its abilities, can still be heard in the aether, perhaps meaning that it was used at her worst point to create a faux pas kind of heaven, something which would add up if you believe that Arion used her powers to let herself live as Arianna CO at S23, meaning for the brief time she was able to project herself to life with Ellie yet again, only for it to eventually fall apart again. There are other meanings that this could have, perhaps that even in someone's worst moments, they can still use their abilities, they can still project themselves to the Aether, which could have suggestions of all sorts of things. 
Our next two documents are found after the death of Issa, where the devs have put forth two new documents. First, Prometheus, which reads as follows. Here sit I, forming mortals after my image, a face resembling me, to suffer, to weep, to enjoy, to be glad, and thee to scorn as I. This document is a bit confusing in a vacuum. Clearly, it tells of Prometheus and his gift to mankind that by creating human life, it can have both joy and pain. But a possible explanation for it in Signalis would be that this document could be an allusion to the Empress, for she created mortals in the form of replicas, and perhaps part of that creation's goal was for them to experience what it means for humans to experience what she went through. The potential meaning of the Empress having a motive for creation outside domination further redefines this already complex character, enough such that to delve deeper here would likely miss nuance. So I think we should continue with the other document, Bioresonance Phenomena. This document reads, Synchronicity, a phenomena that are meaningfully related yet lack a causal relationship. We've yet to discover the true source of the ability of the mind to alter the physical world. Yet creating physical phenomena remotely based by simply or unconsciously willing them into existence forms the basis for the entire field of bioresonance technology. For the advent of bioresonance technology, a causal correlations were often falsely interpreted as chance. Many phenomena, such as remote viewing, doppelgangers, or the poly effect, have since been classified as synchronistic phenomena related to bioresonance effects. The world we live in would be impossible without bioresonance, but its origins remain unclear. If it was truly a gift from outer space, as the late Empress claimed, why was she defeated by her great revolutionary, who had no such divine powers? We know the answer to this hypothetical question, as she was ultimately felled by her own doing. However, the other details of this document bring a further hammer to vastly expand our knowledge of bioresonance. Bioresonance is causation by correlation. Things which happen to be similar in the universe of Signalis are directly related. This means that anything which happens to align could be seen as causational, due to the effects of bioresonance. A bit of information is interesting. On one hand, I'd wager the dev's intent for this and what we should really focus on with this was to draw attention to several character pairs, these being Arianne's white hair and the Empress's, Arianne and Elena, Elster and Lilith. These pairs and their relation have already been explored heavily, and arguably with this bit of lore, the degree of their relation perhaps should be expanded and revisited. However, the other hand, it's the potential issues it may cause. Signalis is a game of gray and confusion, likely by design. To state that correlation is causation, or that it could be, is to redefine an entire line of logic that exists, to really navigate the confusion of Signalis, adding piles of new possibilities that will frankly do little more than add more confusion to this puzzle. While I am optimistic for the new spawnings that will be found using this new ideal for bioresonance, I also wonder if it will seek to just further confuse, removing the very little stable ground theories already had to grow on. Or if maybe I'm just overanalyzing this particular document. Maybe it is just another example of the nation not really understanding bioresonance and making vague statements that we maybe shouldn't take seriously. But that's all I really have in regards to the new lore from this update. It's quite a lot, which is why I'm surprised I haven't covered it up to this point. But now that I have, I hope that this will at least help you get an idea on how to start digging into this. My conclusions here are anything but conclusive, so feel free to dig into the source material yourself and make alternative findings. That is part of the beauty of theories, after all. While I'm here, I'd like to thank Derek Sai and Waits for joining the channel membership. It means a lot to me and helps me continue to produce videos, which is something I adore doing. But that's all for today, and I will see you all next time.